<laughs> so I want to go over just how I have um, Canvas kind of organized <clears throat> so you can see where I'm putting stuff. Um, for this class, typically I'm going to be giving you some sort of content. It's going to be videos or photos or whatever it is. Um, <clears throat> eventually I'll have a Dropbox folder in here where you can access everything that I put on there. For right now, it's on the classroom systems. So for now, just know that that's coming. Um, I haven't set it up yet. Um, but on here is the make a class list. <clears throat> if you needed to know what classes uh, are in your program, your specialty, this is just the updated or the latest uh, brochure area. Um, shouldn't affect anyone in here. I think everyone's good. But if you haven't declared your major yet, make sure you've declared your major, okay? Um, that way your classes are actually going towards a degree. For some reason, people just start taking classes but never actually like say, I'm going towards this degree. Things change and then you kind of lose some of that stuff. Uh, the calendar is here from last time. So you can look at that if you lose it. The student agreement that I passed out today, make on Vimeo, make on Facebook. Here's my YouTube channel. <clears throat> Submission form, which we'll get into next class. Um, we don't really need to worry about these storyboards or animation things yet. First to hand out the new hotkeys I just passed out, the definitions. And then this is going to be your homework for um, tonight and um, for the weekend is to go through and read this thing here, which is layer-based versus node-based compositing. I'll have another link too um, that I want you to read. I just didn't put that one in there yet. Uh, but it's all about just the difference in what Nuke is compared to what After Effects is and the benefits of one versus the benefits of the other, okay? Um, so that's one of those things. I'll add the other one right now to... And the other one is Sphere. <clears throat> and this will be the other one, which is understanding layers and channels. Um, everything that we do inside of Nuke with nodes, it's a lot different than just kind of going in there and painting something or shading it or whatever it is. <clears throat> There's a lot of stuff that we have to understand about just how the image itself is read and what we can store in it and what we can do with it. Um, so these two things uh, from now until next Wednesday is... Um, you're reading homework. Yep. Layers and channels. Two articles. Uh, layers and channels, and the other one is misnamed. Uh, nodes and layers. There we go. So these two things here in Canvas, read those. Um, today we're going to start getting into Nuke, setting up our folders, <clears throat> and then starting this uh, multi-pass compositing. For each one of our assignments, I'll have a, uh, an example. As we get to the assignment, I'll start to unlock them. So right now you won't see any of these other ones that aren't there, that aren't unlocked yet, but the other ones you'll see. Um, all the stuff that I give, if I have a lecture, it'll be up on here. If I have source materials, something, it'll be up on Canvas here inside the modules. Um, we did the discussion board. Everyone, um, except for a couple people, did a great job. <clears throat> um, 16 or 17 out of 18 is a pretty good number. 15 out of 15 or 15 out of 18, I don't know about that. Uh, but for the most part, everyone did good. I haven't even looked at them yet because I want to make sure that I came in today and saw what was there and then I look at it. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll look at those too. Uh, so this is what we're going to be kind of looking at today inside of our new composition is <clears throat> um, how do we take something that's been rendered in 3D and break it down and rebuild it and adjust it as needed. So you can see in this case, they actually have a product <clears throat> that is being put together inside this scene. These are all the different passes or all the different renderings and layers that were rendered out of the software so that when they get into Nuke, they can create what they want to create inside here, okay? All right. 
So I'm going to close that stuff. Um, on your computers, everyone has their computer up. <clears throat> if you don't have your computer up, turn your computer on. And we're going to create our folder structure and then uh, copy the files we need and then get into um, actually playing with Nuke. Um, has anyone here not used PCs before? Good. Um, in this lab, <clears throat> the C drive, the documents, the desktop, the downloads, those are um, don't save areas. Don't put anything in those folders because when the computers reboot, that information is gone. So don't do that. We save everything in here to the P drive. You definitely don't want to work off of a thumb drive in this class. You, if you're going to work off a hard drive, it needs to be an external. The files are going to be constantly reading and writing, so it's going to be a lot of uh, taxing work on those hard drives if you do have that. Okay, So go to your P drive, <clears throat> and you're going to make a folder structure like so for your stuff. Where is my blue pen? So you're going to use uh, your last name underscore W19. <clears throat> And then you'll make a folder inside there. That is your last name, underscore W19, underscore 2560. If you have me in other classes, obviously that first folder is already done for you. You're just creating that second folder. Okay, so just right on the P drive, make this folder, last name, W19, uh, inside that folder, last name, W19-2560. On the computer on the left, <clears throat> click on that computer. Yeah, and go to P drive. It's right there. Yep. 2560. Mm -hmm. uh, no, you can just drop it inside the 1900 one. Okay, Nuke is one of those softwares very much like After Effects <clears throat> where everything that we do is going to be bringing things together. Okay, It's not something that you would typically go into Nuke and start with nothing and just start building stuff right inside there. Um, so we need to make sure that all these folders that we have here are set up so that we can put stuff in the right folders, keep ourselves organized, and then as we start animating stuff and bringing stuff in, it's all set up. So then you're going to make <clears throat> a new folder with your last project or your last name underscore project and literally just call it project. And these are all off of your uh, cheat sheet, so you can write them down from there. Inside that project folder, that's where you'll create these folders. All right, so this is what the folders do. <clears throat> Output, yep. I spelled it wrong on there, and I want to see if anyone caught it. <laughs> Output. <laughs> uh, image. Right, it, it, there's an extra P, but that's fine. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, that doesn't matter. Um, so image sequence, anytime we get an image sequence, typically this is going to be something that's rendered out from um, 3D that would go inside there. Or if we had a movie, <clears throat> typically we're going to bring that movie into After Effects, export it out as a sequence, and then bring that into Nuke. We would never bring a, a straight up video right inside Nuke because it works very slow and doesn't very, it's not very accurate. Okay. 
Um, so any image sequences we have here inside that folder, depending on what we're bringing in, we will have a folder for that specific image sequence. If it's a green screen, we would say green screen, blah, 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 and then we would have it inside that folder. Uh, geometry is anything 3D that I give you. <clears throat> for some things, I'll say, okay, here's a piece of 3D geometry. We're going to use it. You'll drop it into that folder. Audio um, is audio, but Nuke doesn't handle audio, okay? This will be when we get back into After Effects. If we needed a piece of audio to sync up or utilize, we would use it there. Movies is where we bring the original movies in. <clears throat> Output is where you render stuff out. And then reference is just reference. The more reference you have for your stuff, the better off you would understand what things are supposed to look like. There's a lot of things that we're going to be doing inside the software where, um, you know, what does a shadow look like? If we're going to draw a shadow for a character, or draw a shadow back into the scene, what should it look like? It's not just like a square or a circle that's like fuzzy. That's not a shadow. Okay, so all those things we have to be aware of. Uh, all of our stuff needs to stay organized. If it doesn't stay organized, then you get this big headache every time you work on your stuff of relinking every single file that you have. It's not like After Effects where it'll automatically relink everything. You literally would have to go through and relink every single thing um, one by one. There's ways around it, but I will make you do that just so that you learn your lesson, okay? Um, naming your files, last name, underscore, project name, underscore, zero, zero, whatever. Very rarely has any nuke file ever corrupted on me. That doesn't mean it won't happen. It's always best to save as different iterations, 01, 02, 03. These files are really small because they're linking things together. That's all they're doing. They are not um, holding a bunch of information inside them themselves, okay? Um, The cheat sheet on it has <clears throat> the file sizes and compressions. <clears throat> These are base numbers. If we get a video and the video is a different resolution, we'll adjust these accordingly. If the video is 24 frames a second, we'll do ours at 24 frames a second because we don't want to stretch out a video to do something to it because then it would look kind of off, okay? So we want to match whatever our source is. So this is just, in this case, it's a base. If we don't have a video or whatever, we're going to use 30 frames a second. And then these, we'll get to that when we get to it. Okay, so keep your cheat sheet uh, handy as you need it. All right, now on your uh, P drive here, uh, where's my 2560 folder? You guys distracted me, I didn't even get to make one. Yes, I did. Maybe I didn't. Where am I at? <laughs> MW19, 2560, image, sequence, output, that did again, movies, audio, and that's how you make folders and rename them. Control shift N, makes a new folder, type it in, hit enter, go on to the next one. Uh, cool. And I didn't even make the project folder. So you guys really distracted me. I have to make one right here. There we go. I don't need the W19 there. Let me just get rid of that. All right, cool. Now, every project is gonna have the same folder structure. So now we can either, um, every time we make a new project, <clears throat> make all those folders again, or we can copy this folder and use it every time we have a new project. What do you wanna do? Copy it. Good. Good answer. So, how do you copy something? Control C. How do you paste it? Control V. Control v right? Or you can control drag it to get another copy. So, get a, another copy of this and call this game controller. Your last name underscore game controller. Okay, now we're gonna get fancy. We need two windows open. We need to get access to the server so we can download files, and then we need to be able to copy them into our folder. So however you wanna do that, 
that's up to you. We need to get to the server that is Z. No, it's the Y, I think. The one that says uh, make a inst. That's Y, yeah. Okay. Uh, go to the make a inst, which is, I believe, your Y drive. Uh, come on. There we go. On your Y drive in 2560, there's a folder called footage, <clears throat> and inside there, there's one called game station renders. You need to copy that and put that into your image or your image sequence folder for that game controller. Why? Three gigs. <clears throat> it should be under your computer. And then Y drive. So do not do this <clears throat> because we're adults. We do not click on the start menu and then go find our software. We click on the start menu or the window button on our keyboard and we type in nuke X. <clears throat> okay. We need to again work faster to get all of these things going because uh, nuke will crash, our files don't get corrupt, but nuke will crash like a lot. We have <coughs> nuke X, um, this is the ones on my computer. Nuke X 11.3 v1, 11.1 v1, 2.5, non commercial, non commercial, non commercial. You always want the nuke X without the non commercial junk on it. That's fine. You, whatever version you have on yours, I just have the latest one. Everything that I'm doing will be fine on yours too. Will be fine for that too. Yep, they will be able to go back and forth. <clears throat> yep. The only thing that would happen is if you had a, a plugin that wasn't in there, then there would be issues. But so far, there's nothing that we'll be using in this class that will be outside of those realms. Okay. Uh, if you open up the different version of Nuke, some of the features of things that we're doing will not be available. So you just have to be aware of that because it will happen. You'll go into there and you'll say, this feature isn't available. You're telling me to add this button, and that button is not there. And so then you have to close it, open up Nuke X, and then everything is happy. Um, just like every other software, you never double-click your files to open it up because when you double-click your files, it's going to default to which one? Which nuke? It'll do this one, which is not the X one. Or it'll do the non-commercial one, which is not the X one, or not the correct one. So you always want to open up the software and then go and find your file and do whatever, OK? All right. So this is uh, the nuke interface. <clears throat> it seems uh, pretty simple. I think I showed this last class. There's a lot of stuff going on inside here, um, a lot of things. All of our hotkeys that we have on those sheets will work if you're in the right area. <clears throat> if I'm up here and I hit a hotkey, is different than if I'm down here and hit a hotkey. So where my mouse is at will, rel will depend on what hotkey is functioning, okay? If I'm up here and I hit S, <clears throat> it brings up the viewer's settings. If I'm down here and hit S, it brings up my project settings, OK? So you have to be aware that they're like two completely different things. If I'm over here and hit R, it shows me my red channel. If I'm down here and hit R, it brings up my read node, OK? Again, something to pay attention to. If your hotkeys aren't working, just where is your mouse at to make sure that you're in the right spot, OK? <clears throat> All right, so I want you to go down into this area and hit S. Into your node graph area, that's what this is, the node graph down here and hit S. <clears throat> There's a way inside of Nuke to tell Nuke, this is the project I'm working on. And if something were to happen uh, where we changed computers, all we would have to do is redirect our main project to this area, say, our project isn't in this folder anymore, now it's in this folder, and all of our stuff will update correctly. If we don't do this, then we have to go back and click each one individually and reload each file individually. 
Again, if you enjoy doing that, that's on you, not me. Um, so we have to tell it what is the name of our project. So this is going to be uh, game system underscore, uh, or actually, sorry, sarcona underscore game system underscore zero zero one. So your last name <clears throat> underscore the project, which is game system, underscore zero zero one. Then under project directory, that's where we point it to that main game system folder. <clears throat> um, you will be very uh, frustrated if you don't pay attention to the next one. Nuke does not care about double clicks to get into folders. Okay. Um, so if you're in regular Windows software and you see a folder and you double click it to get in it, right? No. In Windows, you just click on the, or in Nuke, you just click on the folder and it'll get you in there. So watch how I single click there. I find my folder here for my P drive, single click, single click. It's my P drive though. Uh, single click, and then there's the game controller, and then I say open. Okay? So you just single click on all these folders until you get to that game controller one, and then you hit open. <clears throat> so next class we come in. We go here, set our project, open up our file, everything should be happy, okay? If we don't do that, then we have to relink things. So some things we want to pay attention to, <clears throat> uh, our frame range for this, this is how many frames obviously we'll have. <clears throat> uh, for this one, let me see how many frames I put. I think it's like 300 and some. Wow. Uh, oops. Maybe not, maybe it's only 200. 200, okay. So uh, frame range is one to 200. <clears throat> Frames per second are 30. And I believe these are all 1280 by 720, but I will just open them up and verify. Open with. Yep, it's 1280 by 720, just cut off at the bottom. Cool. So we're going to click on this uh, full size format and choose uh, 1280 by 720 or HD 720 from the list. Okay. Now all this is doing is just helping Nuke understand what kind of footage we're bringing into the software. Anytime you create something in it, uh, it's gonna automatically default to whatever size is here. <clears throat> so if I were to create a solid in After Effects, it knows what size should this thing be, and it asks you and you can punch that data in. In Nuke, if I create something, it just defaults, like whatever size you put here, that's what I'm gonna use. So you end up with these like really obscure sizes for things uh, that don't match your footage. So we wanna make sure that's uh, good there. All right, uh, that's good. So we're just gonna hit Control S and save. Oops. Uh, you may have to click on the name thing and put it right into your folder. I don't know why it's doing that. Yes? The name name. So I had to click on this and hit save or open, and then it should allow me to save it. Yes, there it goes. Nope, just right in the main area. <clears throat> just at the top, <clears throat> if you make a change, you'll see a little asterisk oh, next yeah. to that. Like a, like a, a okay. So the file extension for these are .nk files. So if we ever lose a file, we can just search for .nk, and it should find all those .nk files, and then hopefully one of them is ours. Um, Nuke will do a weird thing where it'll actually let you save a file without a name. So you can save it, not give it a name, and Nuke's totally 100% fine with that, and it's very weird that it'll do that. Okay, so... <clears throat> That's our project setting, so we just want to make sure that for every project that those are set up. Um, like you've already been doing, 
it's always good to check just to make sure. You could spend, you know, three hours working on something and then you're like, oh, where'd the file go? I don't know where it went. There's my file, okay? So you'll see in, in this case, it's not even really showing anything here. Um, which is weird, it should be showing something, right? There we go. Yeah, oh, there it is. Uh, I didn't put a .nk at the end of it, <clears throat> so uh, do that too, that's a new thing. So at the very end of your name here, put .nk and then save it. Where it says name, yep. Nuke does something pretty awesome that other softwares don't do is that it will automatically autosave throughout regardless of what your preferences are. <clears throat> and sometimes, let's say we didn't do anything and Nuke crashed, Next time I boot Nuke up, it'll say, hey, you have a, an autosave. Do you want to load that? And typically, that it's, it's pretty close to like where you left off. So uh, it's pretty sweet how it'll do that. Okay. So our stuff is saved. It's got the file extension on there. Um, I want to close the project settings. I'm done with that right now. So I can click on the far right X here, and that will close those settings. Okay. So just the far right Xs in that properties area will close that area from being loaded in the properties. <clears throat> Everything inside Nuke is customizable. You can have tabs where you want, you can split screens, you can have viewers and whatever else that you want there. All of these little things are different ways that you could split an area and add new windows to it. If you don't want to use this entire properties thing, you could split it. Now you have two areas and then down here you could add uh, the dope sheet, there we go. Or you could add another viewer, and now the viewer's down here, okay? So you can move stuff around all over the place, and then you can just pray that you get everything back to where it was. Uh, close that pane. Pull that back down, close this pane. Pane, there it is. Uh, this is our viewer. <clears throat> Everything that we are working on, we typically want to feed it into a viewer so that we can see it. Down here, this is the node graph. Might sneeze? Nope. <clears throat> All right. This is the node graph. So everything that we typically do work-wise is going to be in this area. Okay. This is where we see the results of that area down here. <clears throat> in After Effects, Photoshop, Illustrator, you have a layer stacking, okay? That's layer-based editing, okay? This is node-based editing. So instead of seeing layers stacked on top of each other, we see a node and a node, and we connect those two things together. Think of it like uh, a bunch of little lakes. We have a lake here, a lake here, and we have these streams that feed together. Where those streams come together, we're seeing the result of these two lakes coming together, okay? That's what we have to kind of visualize as we do this. If we want to see where those two lakes come together, I can't look at this lake and I can't look at that lake. I have to look at where they actually come together, okay? So it'll be a little bit confusing at first. We'll figure it out. Is everyone done copying? Anyone still copying? No? Still going? <laughs> All right, that's fine. Um, on the left side here, you can't see the left side because my screen's cut off. There we go. All right. On the left side here, these are all the tools that are inside of Nuke. Every single one of the tools that we will be accessing is right inside there. <clears throat> Once you kind of get around it, you can see where things are hidden and where things are at. If you don't know what something is called, especially as a beginner, um, go through the menus and just kind of look at it to see what's even available. Because you might not realize like, oh, I didn't know that retiming was a thing I could do inside Nuke. I'm going to do that here versus trying to do something else. Uh, or if I go to my color correction tab, here's a bunch of different color correction things. Um, these are all different uh, filters, <clears throat> blurs and whatnot. Yes, sir? Is it a coincidence that it's shaped like the eye of a Martian who wore the world? Sure. <laughs> Way down here, you mean? Where are we talking about? Oh, 
Oh, this? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure it's a coincidence. Um, so here's all the keying things. Here's all the layer merging. Here's transforming stuff, 3D, and so on. Okay. So as a beginner, definitely look through those menus and see what's available, especially when you get into color correction, like what's available for color correction. The tools are different. They work differently than they would in Photoshop or, or After Effects. Uh, but you just need to understand the basics of them, okay? So let's create something down here so that we can at least play while we're waiting for this to finish on everyone's computer. So instead of me going through one of these menus and grabbing something, <clears throat> I'm gonna make sure my mouse is down in this area and I'm gonna hit the tab key. And this allows me to type in any command that's available and bring something up. So I wanna create a checker box or a checkerboard. So I'm gonna start typing checkerboard. And once I type the word check, <clears throat> you'll see that checkerboard is the first thing that shows up, okay? What's that? Tab. So hit the tab key down here and type in check. And then you can click on checkerboard or you can hit the down arrow and then hit enter and that'll open the checkerboard. What? Okay. Now this is a checkerboard. <clears throat> Notice how we don't see the actual checkerboard loaded up here, right? Why don't we see that? Any guesses? Exactly, right? So we don't, we're not viewing anything at the moment. We need to connect it to the viewer so we can see what's happening. <clears throat> the viewer has this arrow coming off of it that says the number one. The checkerboard has an arrow coming off the bottom of it here. I want to connect these two things. What do you think I'm gonna do? Drag and drop, drag and drop <clears throat> right? So if I drag checkerboard uh, arrow to the viewer, that works. If I were to drag the arrow for the viewer back to the checkerboard, that would also work, okay? So do that, and then we should see the checkerboard in the main screen. It's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> hit uh, tab and then type checkerboard in your bottom screen. Nope, hit tab again. Look here. You hit tab here. Again, hotkeys are important, right? So we hit tab up at the top, it takes us into 3D mode. So move down to the bottom node graph area and hit tab. And then you can type in checkerboard. It is. <clears throat> it's very jarring when you're not used to it. And then just drag your arrow from one to the other. There you go. Okay. Um, so, this is the checkerboard being viewed. <clears throat> Slide the checkerboard off to the left side and then click off the checkerboard. Slide the checkerboard off to the left and just click off of it. Hit the tab key again and type in color bars. <clears throat> okay, so now I want to see what the color bars look like. So what do I do? Drag the arrow to the viewer. Drag the arrow to the viewer. Did it work? Nope, didn't work, right? But what happened when we did that? Yep, but what do we have here? What's the number next to it? Two. Two. So the viewer can support nine different items being piped into it, and this allows us to cycle between different images as we want. So drag both arrows off of the checkerboard or off the viewer. Just drag them up and let go so that nothing is connected to the viewer. Okay. Then click on the color bars and hit the number one. <clears throat> okay. So if we wanted to see what the color bars look like, we can click on that, hit one, and it'll feed that into the number one port or the number one channel of the viewer. If we click on the checkerboard and we hit two, you can see what it does, right? So now the checkerboard is in two, the uh, color bars are in one, whichever one is highlighted is the one that we're seeing. 
<clears throat> now, move your mouse into the viewer area and toggle between one and two. Okay, now this seems like a really silly thing, but imagine that you're in After Effects or Photoshop, you have a thousand layers or 10 layers or 100 layers, whatever it is, and you wanna just see like, what does it look like here? It's very difficult to do that. You have to hide layers and do whatever. Here we can actually see like, what's before the effect, what's after the effect, and you can toggle very quickly between them. You could have different stages of things happening. <clears throat> if I had a shot, like this is the end result of my shots, this is the shot that I'm working on, I could always jump back and see what the before and afters are, what I'm trying to uh, acquire there, okay? All right, so break those connections, just drag them off again. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna merge these two things together. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to create a merge node. So you can hit the tab key, uh, type in merge, and create a merge node. Or you can just hit the letter M, whichever one you want to do. Merge, regular old merge. Okay. <laughs> Now do you see how many arrows Merge has? Two. Four. <laughs> right? Right? Some of these are inputs, one of these is an output. Okay, we can only output basically, I mean you can output it to several spots, but this is like one output. Um, the two arrows at the top, A and B, that's the two things that we're merging together. Okay? Um, the one that's on the right, if I drag that out, you'll see how it says mask. Okay, so I may want to put two things together, but have a mask that affects only where those two things merge. Okay, if we pull this arrow out to the side, that's where we'll see the mask come in. <clears throat> uh, so I don't need to worry about that. And then this is the result. Okay, so two things come in. I want to see that result. That's what that other arrow is for. So if I drag this one, and it might be hard to see, but this is an A and a B arrow. So I'm gonna drag the A arrow to checkerboard and the B arrow to color bars. And I'm still not seeing the result of it because? Right, what do I connect to the viewer? The merge, yep. So click on that and hit one. So how does it look? Pretty much the same, right? <clears throat> we have not told it how to merge. Right now it's just doing an over. So think of Photoshop, we have one layer, another layer is just on top of it. That's all that's happened, okay? Um, <clears throat> make sure your A is the checkerboard. You're at the next step. So uh, this has transparency on it. I know that because if I use my scroll wheel and I zoom in on the checkerboard, <clears throat> I can see this white box here. And so what Nuke does is it says, okay, if there's transparency, where is it transparent? And then it'll automatically put it where it's transparent. The checkerboard has transparency, but the transparency value is zero, okay? So it's basically like there's no transparency to it. It's fully opaque. The color bars have no transparency listed here, so it's automatically gonna try to make a transparency based off of the brightness of the color bars, all right? So what's happening is A is on top, no transparency. B is on bottom, it has no information being read for transparency, so it's just covering it up. If I switch A and B, we should get a different result. So let's disconnect those and just connect them the other way. because it doesn't have an actual alpha channel, so Nuke is just creating one for us. It's kind of like it doesn't know what the transparency should be, so it guesses what it is, until we force it to say, no transparency for you, <clears throat> and then it will do what the other one did. Yes, sir? So why does it leave the white, the white space? It's just how it seems like it's showing because of the brightness of it. 
the white is the brightest area, so it's going to be the fully opaquest. Okay. Um, cool. So that's what that does. Uh, now, instead of us disconnecting these and then reconnecting them, because that's kind of like a hassle to do, let's just say we wanted to swap the A and B. Okay. So there's actually a hotkey for doing that, which is Shift X. So if you click on the merge and you just hit Shift X, it'll actually just swap the A and the B. Okay, so you can see how very easily we could do that. And you can also see how we're gonna get different results based on what is connected where and what is being fed into it. Claire, I think you hit tab, so hit tab again. There you go. <laughs> the benefit of sitting towards the screen is that you can see me. The benefit of sitting away from it is I can see you. <laughs> cool, all right, so that's what Shift X can do. <clears throat> Let's say that we wanted to, um, uh, see what it looks like without having a merge on there. Uh, it would basically be one or the other, so it's not like a huge advantage. So let's do something different to one of these items. Um, let's add a, a, a grade. Let's add a grade to the color bars, okay? So I'm going to click on the color bars, <clears throat> and there's hotkeys for everything. You have hotkeys on your sheet. You could hit tab, type in the word grade, or what do you think the hotkey is for grade? G. So you can just hit G. <clears throat> so you can consider grade very much like a levels uh, uh, adjustment <clears throat> without the fancy graph in the middle. So we have basically a black point, a white point, a lift, a gain, a multiply, a blah, blah, blah. Okay. So if we just adjusted some of these parameters, <clears throat> you can see what it's doing to uh, the color bars here. So just adjust some of them so that we get a different result. Oh, that's cool. Right, backwards. All right, and because we're adjusting the coloring on the color bars, it's also adjusting the transparency of the color bars, which then affects, obviously, that merge. Okay? <clears throat> So now, let's see what happens if we don't have that grade in there. Uh, hit, click your merge and hit Shift X, because you just have it backwards still. There you go. So I want to turn on and turn off this grade, <clears throat> or I want to disable, disable the grade. So what the hotkey do you think I use for disable? What? D, yep. So just hit D. Toggle it on and off. Okay, again, it just makes your life a lot easier being able to obviously switch between these two, disable nodes as you're going. Sometimes you may use a node to create something and realize I don't want to use this, or that feature is taking way too long to calculate. I'm just going to disable it, and then when I get down to the end, I'll just re-enable it when I'm, when I'm done, okay? Cool. Um, let's go back to color bars here, okay? Uh, one of the things we have to always make sure of is that we're staying <clears throat> organized, obviously, outside of our file, but also organized inside here. Nobody likes a sloppy node graph, okay? Um, I'm slow battery. So look at how nicely I have this organized here. That is beautiful, right? Uh, it's actually not beautiful though. Um, <clears throat> my A is on this side and the B is on that side. We can't have that. I need the B to be on the other side of this. Okay. So I'm going to drag the checkerboard over here and drag my merge over there. Okay. So my color bars go into the grade, go into the merge, and the checkerboard is right above it. It seems trivial and it seems like this guy's nuts. Let's just do this stuff but you will see a huge benefit to keeping yourself organized. Um, a thousand things in it. <laughs> right? So we always want to stay organized with our stuff. It's very easy to get very lost in everything that we do in the software if we are not. 
<clears throat> I've gone to student stations where they have one node in the middle and they have 75 nodes kind of clustered around it all over the place and you can't tell where's the end one, where's this, where's that, how do we connect these things together. Think of your stuff as this chain of things that flow from one area to the other. <clears throat> if you want something to pipe in or to feed into it, it should be in a nice little area designated and kind of go into it. It should not be all cluttered in there. Make it look nice. Okay, um, beautiful. Let's look at our color bars. Click on the color bars and hit number one. You just move them, just drag them around. Okay, um, looking at the color bars, <clears throat> we can see um, exactly what we saw before, it's just that. But let's move our mouse up to this area here and let's drag our mouse just around to the different colors and notice this down here. Watch these things change as you're moving your mouse from bar to bar to bar. Okay. It's beautiful, isn't it? Spend hours doing this. Right? So this is reading all the color information down here. <clears throat> How many colors do you think I could have inside Nuke? Actually more, <laughs> more colors, right? So if you think of each one of these things as a different color, right? So uh, here's white. And for whatever reason, this isn't pure white. Why aren't you pure white? Let me go there, that's fine, whatever. Um, this white here is pretty close. It's 99.11. <clears throat> so if zero is where it starts and it can go up to 99.11, how many numbers did it get to that point? <clears throat> if the number started at zero and there's 99.11, yes, sir? All your colors are gone where? Uh, up at the top here, uh -huh. does it say RGBA? Yeah, it does now. It does now, good. <laughs> the colors are still gone. Just for white, just on this one thing, or just for this red, how many different numbers of red are there? <clears throat> Correct. Nine, to, to get to that, there's 9,911 9, 9, different values they got to that point for that one color. Now that is not the limit. It can go into the tens of thousands, well, tens of thousands of colors for any single one of these channels. So in Nuke, you can actually deal with like trillions of colors, <clears throat> more colors than you would uh, care to play with. Um, now, the neat thing is that we don't use color information just for colors. We can actually use it to like actually generate 3D scenes inside of here we can basically export like where is every single point in my 3D, uh, in my image, where is it in 3D world? Bring that here and it'll actually recreate my 3D scene inside of here. It's pretty sweet. Um, so there's lots of different levels of coloring that happens inside here. <clears throat> also, it's non-destructive. If I go into Photoshop and I put a levels on something and then I go down, let's say a day later and I come into Photoshop and, and try to undo that levels, you can't undo it. That information is gone. Because of how this is all laid out, if I do a grade on here which destroys the image, I should be able to put another grade on it to get those colors back because all that information still exists. It's just a matter of accessing those points again, okay? Or obviously I could just disable it. Um, cool. So lots of colors inside here. Now let's look at just some of the colors. So if we move, move our mouse into this area and we hit R, <clears throat> what was R in the bottom area? Read, that's how we read files into it. That was a trick question because we didn't actually go over that. <laughs> Up here though, what do you think R stands for? <clears throat> nope, red, right? So R is for red. So now we're looking at all of the red values in this area. Uh, I don't know why mine's not showing it, but typically it'll show it like up here. 
Uh, maybe my screen's not big enough. I don't know. It should show it up here. Typically, it'll say R up here. But yeah, it's only showing the red channel. <clears throat> what if I want to see the green channel? And then blue channel? And then transparency? <clears throat> a for alpha. Mm. Transparency is not a channel. It's a... Uh, Alpha is the channel. <clears throat> Whatever button you just clicked, click it again. So if you clicked A, A brings it back. If you click B, B brings it back. B, B brings it back. There we go. Okay. Um, so sometimes you will need to look at this stuff. Sometimes there will be information or data kind of hidden inside of one of those other channels that we would then use for something else. Okay. Um, or we do a color selection, we need to know what color it is. Yes, sir? Uh, I don't have any color ID in there. Just control Z. Or you can click it and delete it. Yep, yeah, either way. Um, so we hit A. This gives us the alpha channel. Remember, I said there was no alpha channel on color bars, right? So Nuke just creates it. <clears throat> if we click on checkerboard and hit one, Now we see the, uh, the alpha channel for the checkerboard, which is solid, wi uh, solid white. Now let's say that I didn't want an alpha channel on checkerboard. Okay, So if I go into, um, this is shuffle, Okay, so that's what we're going to do. Uh, I'm going to click on here, I'm going to hit the tab key, and I'm going to go to shuffle. Okay. If you click on an item and you add a node, <clears throat> it'll automatically add it right after that item. Okay. So if I click on checkerboard, created a shuffle node, it automatically drops it right after the checkerboard. Okay. Just tab and then shuffle. <clears throat> uh, the shuffle node uh, will allow us to change or to move channels around. Okay, because it's important, obviously, to see red, green, blue, and some of the other stuff. But it also is important to be able to change what we have there. So this is really confusing <clears throat> how they have it set up. But basically, this is saying that the red channel is coming from the red, the green channel is coming from the green, the blue channel is coming from the blue, and then the alpha channel is coming from the alpha channel. Okay, um, you would do other stuff with it. In this case, we're just going to do this. Which, go ahead. Just shuffle channel. Yep. Uh, not move it around, but uh, adjust what's inside of it, okay? Or pull a channel out. Uh, if I wanted to have just like one layer that was just the alpha channel, I could pull that out. Uh, if I want a channel that's just red, I could pull that red channel out and use it for something else. So in this case, I'm going to go to where we have the alpha, which is this bottom box, and just make it black. And so now what I've done is just basically eliminated the alpha channel from there or, or filled in the alpha channel with black, okay? So it's essentially the same thing that we would have in the other spot. All right, so a couple things to pay attention to when you do something like this. <clears throat> We're adjusting the alpha channel, so obviously we need to be looking at the alpha channel. If I am looking at the red, green, blue, I don't right off the bat see the alpha, so I have to hit A up here so I can see the alpha. Okay, And then as I do my settings, then I'll start to see some of those things change. This bottom one is the alpha right there. Okay. Um, <coughs> this one, this whole bottom row. Okay. Now, let's say that I wanted to take the blue channel and put that into the alpha. I click this blue one, and now my blue channel is now my alpha channel. We're not doing that. We have no reason to do that in this case, but that's what we could do, okay? <clears throat> that's what's kind of neat about um, a lot of these nodes is how they function and do this kind of stuff. A lot of times we'll take a node uh, or an item or a picture or a video or whatever, and we'll create channels inside of it that we could then call upon later. And that's one of the things we're going to do once our, um, our game systems are all ready to go, is we'll be breaking it apart, putting it all back together, and then we're able to tweak all of these things to get them to look the way we need them to look. Okay, um, And using these kinds of things, we're able to do that. 
we could also look up here <clears throat> um, and under this in RGB, we could pull out different channels. In this case, there's no other channels. It's just the checkerboard stuff, okay? Uh, but once we get more images, we'll see that kind of thing. Cool. All right, so delete those things. We don't need them anymore. All that hard work. Yeah, if you delete the viewer, it's no big deal. You can just click one and it'll automatically rebuild the viewer for you. <clears throat> All right, so we should be good now. Everyone's stuff is downloaded. Cool. All right, so now we need to read in our files. We want to read in that game system, okay? So uh, we are going to hit R for read while we're down in this main area. While you're in the node graph area, hit R. And then go into your image sequence folder. <clears throat> Don't click anything or, or open anything up yet. I just want to point something out so you can see it first. So this is our uh, sequence. It's reading it as one big sequence. If we were in After Effects, we would see all the files in there. We would tell it image sequence, and it would automatically just bring everything in. In here, there it is. Uh, in here, it's automatically reading the name of the file, <clears throat> the fact that it's a sequence, the file type, which is EXR, and then 1 to 200. EXRs are used because they can store more than just RGBA channels. You can store a whole bunch of information inside of them that you couldn't in other, so in other uh, file formats. Okay. Um, down here it says sequences. <clears throat> just for fun, just click it off for a second so you can see. Well, it just shows all the individual layers. Okay. So in case you or individual files, if you if you needed to get one file, you can still bring in one file. Uh, but we don't. We want to bring in a sequence. So we hit R down in the node graph. We found our image sequence. We clicked on that and hit open. Okay, and then we want to preview it, so we hit uh, I got an error. error. Yeah. If your stuff comes out bright white like this, you might still be viewing the alpha channel. So just toggle that button again to get back so you don't see the alpha channel. <clears throat> what button did we do to hit the alpha channel in there? A, right? So just hit A again up there, and it should get rid of the alpha channel. And you should see this animation playing if you hit the play button. Yep, A in the viewer. And then hit play, and then you'll be able to see it. If you need help finding the play button, I can't help you at all. So this is loading super slow. My laptop is not a powerhouse of a station, so it's going to play back very slow, even though this is not a, a crazy complex thing. <clears throat> As it loads, you'll notice the orange bar. That's the memory. That's it loading itself into the memory. Um, if I let it go until it gets to the end, it might start eating away from the front of it to load the end of it, and I'll never actually see it in a real-time playback. Um, Nuke is not really meant, I mean, it can do it, <clears throat> but it's not really meant to be like real-time playbacks of all your stuff because of what we're doing inside it. Typically, it's so complex. You set up all these things, you do test renders, and that's what you're basing all of your animations off of. Yes, sir. Yep. So uh, I'm rewinding, I'm hitting play just to see it. <clears throat> it's there, cool. Okay, so what we want to do is find a good frame. So uh, I'm thinking something like 71 is a good frame. <clears throat> so go to frame 71. What we're going to do to this, we want to be able to see at a, a good area of the screen. So I want to see the coloring. I want to see the lights and all this stuff. If we went to frame zero, nothing's in there. We're only seeing the back of it, basically the reflection. Here, I'm seeing transparency and light and all this other stuff. 
Um, if you zoom in on your node here, just using the scroll wheel and then your middle mouse to get around, you'll see the uh, node <clears throat> has a red, green, blue, that's for the color. It has a white, that's for the alpha channel. It has a purple and then it has a green. <clears throat> so purple means that there is a depth channel that is assigned to it. Depth means how far from the camera when this was rendered is each one of those specific items. The green means that there's a whole bunch of other stuff loaded inside this one, okay? So um, it's important to pay attention to that because let's say I brought a file from 3D, I'm expecting it to have all this stuff. If I don't see those, I've done something wrong, okay? So then I would know, okay, let me jump back, fix it, and then come back in. So uh, I'm going to click on this, <clears throat> go up to the top left and click on where it says RGBA. <clears throat> all of these are all of the different layers that I rendered out, all the different render passes that came out of that. So you'll see there's one called alpha, there's one called depth, there's one called AO, end noise, OID, P, wire coat, and so on and so on and so on. Um, we will not use all of these, but we will definitely use um, a lot of these. Um, there's also some, if I were to go down under other layer, these are ones that Nuke has inside here that are just typically things that it might encounter that it just automatically loads, but we don't typically, I, I didn't render anything out for these, so these are all empty, okay? So there's nothing specifically there. Um, now I wanna see what each one of these look like without doing this. Yep, that's what that looks like, and then going to this, and that's what that looks like, and then going to this, and say that's what that looks like, okay. So I want to be able to see all of them like in a one-shot thing. So I'm gonna hit the tab key, <clears throat> and I'm gonna type in layer contact sheet. <clears throat> and what this does is it takes all the layers that I've done, and it exports them out so that we can see all the layers at one time. So that um, uh, video that we watched at the beginning that was like the example of compositing, you saw this exact thing inside of his, okay? Uh, we can also do show layer names. Obviously that would help. So in the properties area, I'll click show layer names. I might adjust some of my window sizes so I can actually see this stuff. Now, some of these things, uh, like I said, nope, if you just go to show layer names, it should show it right there in the top. What's that? Right there. Uh, so some of these things may look like they're just like a solid color, but because of how Nuke saves information, it's information that's actually there. <clears throat> So as I move my mouse over this area, look at what my red channel is doing. You see the numbers changing right there? It's going from uh, 155, 154, 153, 999,900, whatever. And same thing over here. Okay, so <laughs> that information is there. We just physically can't see it because the red is just so bright, vibrant red, okay? Um, and that's where it's saving that depth information of how far from the camera these items are. Um, using the middle mouse button, I can kind of move around too. You'll see some of these things like this. <clears throat> hey, where's my, oh, this is a layer name for some reason. Um, so this one here we would use as a layer or as a uh, masking tool. If I wanted to go in there and grab this button I have a mask basically. So you asked about rotoscoping. I could rotoscope and just draw something and cut something out. But I can also render something out from 3D that allows me to reselect just that item so I don't have to rotoscope and go frame by frame and follow this around. Um, so here is coat. This is like the coat that would be on top of it. Here's the diffuse. Here's the diffuse uh, albedo. Here's the specular. Here's opacity. Here's my indirect. So I have some like. Um, refractions on there or some bounce light on there. Here's my transmission. So I just have that screen. So these are all things that <clears throat> I think that I would need to put together in order for me to be able to tweak this shape. Oh, there's a wireframe too. There you go. Okay. 
So um, I'm going to take this layer contact sheet and just set it off to the left side of it. Okay. <clears throat> I only use this as a reference. That's not ever going to be like in my actual composition. I'm not going to do anything with it except see what something looks like and then later on use that item. Okay. So I'm going to click off into Nowheresville <clears throat> and add a shuffle. Now this is where um, we want to adjust some of our stuff, okay? Uh, I don't need to see this stuff up here. I'll, I'll show it for the first two and then I'm gonna hide it because I don't need to see it because it's just a repetitive process. Um, but what I need to do is I'm gonna pull out some of the channels that I need. <clears throat> the shuffle is going to allow me to do that. So I'm gonna take my shuffle and just connect it to my game system. So I just grab that top arrow and connect it. I'm going to view the shuffle, so I hit 1, and then over here where it says RGBA, I'm going to change that to diffuse. Okay, so what that does is that shuffle just pulls that diffuse channel out, yep, just diffuse. It pulls it out so that I can use that as a separate layer, okay? So now it's basically like I rendered it out as a separate item. <clears throat> Some people will render their stuff out and have a diffuse file here, a specular file here, a wire file there, or this file here, or that file there, and they have to read all these files in separately and then they can do their work. But typically this is the best workflow to go with. You render everything to one file and then you break it apart and then put it back together, okay? <clears throat> Much smaller files too. Cool. So uh, we're gonna have a lot of these, so I want to name things. So I'm gonna double click my shuffle, make sure that it's the top thing in my properties and call this diffuse. You just click and drag on this type up here. So this is the diffuse channel, I pulled that out. <clears throat> I'm gonna click off, I'm going to hit tab again, add another shuffle, <clears throat> and pull out the transmission channel. What's that? Again? Yep, you can click one again and see it. Transmission. And then once you have diffuse, once you have transmission, then do coat, do specular, and do AO. Where you at? There you are. Okay, so uh, here's all my channels. This is what they should look like. Here's the diffuse, which is like the straight color. Here is my transmission, which is a screen. Here's the coat, <clears throat> which is the glossiness. Here is the shininess on top of it. There's like two layers of gloss. And then here's the ambient occlusion. 
So what I should be able to do is I've split this thing into pieces. I should be able to put it back together and make it look better than the original. That's the whole idea of doing something like this. Okay. So I put these one, two, three, four, five, just so you can see it. You don't have to do that. Okay. Um, Cause now you have to do that. Okay. All right. So now I need to put everything uh, back together. <clears throat> so I'm going to start merging things. Um, try, try, merging or cleaning? I think cleaning first, right? We should say organize first. Um, let's go this up. Okay. So I have to organize this, otherwise it's going to drive me crazy already. Um, I want to do that one. I do like that. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a dot node. <clears throat> so think of like a family tree. It's going to come down from there and then split off into all these little branches and be really, really nice and neat. Um, so I'm just going to click uh, the control key and just click a dot node right in the middle where code is. Okay. <clears throat> the whole purpose of this is to create dots to keep us organized. <clears throat> It's like a silly thing, right? But it is. Yeah, hold the control key and you'll see a bunch of diamonds. You click on this middle one under coat and then that's the one that uh, we're gonna branch off of, okay? So you may have to zoom out or zoom in depending on where you're at. Yeah. Uh, so <clears throat> if all of these five things are connected to this, that is the exact same thing as all of these five connected to that dot, okay? The dot is just an organizational tool, that's it. As long as this comes into a chain that the next step is to go into those, we're fine with that, okay? So I'm going to um, disconnect it from here and connect these two to the dots. Right. <clears throat> right, we're gonna get another step uh, because I'm gonna put more dots in here. That's there, that's there. Connect these to the dots, connect these to the dots. And that's there. And that's there. There we go. Typically, uh, if you're doing this kind of thing, you're gonna flow two directions. You're either gonna flow straight down and that's how your chain is gonna come in, or you're gonna flow straight across, okay? Or sometimes you kind of go down and whatever. Um, so you want to be pretty consistent about how you do your stuff. Right now we're still learning, so it's fine that we're not perfect. We will get there, okay? Uh, so now we need to merge everything back together. <clears throat> so um, what was the hotkey for merge? M. So we make sure nothing is clicked. That's always the safest thing, and then you can just click and add stuff where you want it. Um, you'll also notice <clears throat> I don't have my big screen there. I don't have my viewer. Once you know what we're doing, you can just go right here, hit the, you tap the space bar, and then you can see this whole screen big, and it makes it a lot easier to move nodes around and get them where you need them to be, okay? So I'm just gonna uh, hit M, and then my A is always gonna be coming in from the left, and my uh, B is always gonna be coming in straight down. So B will be coming in straight down. <clears throat> A is gonna be coming in from the left. We're merging diffuse and transmission. Okay, and then I added a dot node so it doesn't go on an angle, so it goes straight down and then over. I'm gonna give myself a little bit more room here too. All right, now <clears throat> I'm gonna tap back out of this so we can see what it looks like. So this is what it looks like when I merge diffuse and transmission together. Um, let's just look at transmission, let's look at diffuse, and then that's them together, okay? Um, cool. I don't wanna leave this as an over, I want to add this as a plus, <clears throat> because all these things should plus add on top of each other. So I'm gonna change this merge from being an over to being a plus. And we shouldn't see a huge change, if at all. It's basically just how the math is being calculated. Okay. 
So now I'm going to do the same thing for coat and specular also. I'm just going to add a merge. <clears throat> the A will come from the left. The B will come from above. Uh, coat is going to be added to the merge. And then specular will be added to that merge. And I'll give myself a little bit more room so it's a little bit more apparent as to what I'm doing. All right, so once we've done those uh, initial steps, <clears throat> like I said, we should be able to get to a point where our stuff looks better, right? <clears throat> um, if we look at this node here, okay, our last merge that we have in here uh, up to specular, and then I also look at what the original looked like, I'm going to make my screen bigger. I have one viewer going to that last node, and I have one viewer going to my original image, and I'm going to switch one and two between them, and you'll see that they look exactly the same at this point. Okay, that's always our initial goal is to make sure they look exactly the same. Then we can tweak stuff. If I want that uh, reflection to be brighter, I can go to the specular and brighten up the reflection. If I want my colors to be adjusted, I can go to the color area and adjust those. Okay, so we're not there yet. We will get there, but we're not there uh, yet to do any of that stuff. Um, let's just disconnect that. <clears throat> so now I'm going to add a merge from this merge to the AO. Same thing, A goes to the left, B goes to the AO. As Austin pointed out, that don't look right, <clears throat> right? <laughs> um, the plus or the over is doing exactly that. It's literally taking numbers here and numbers there and it puts them together. So if I were to look at what the AO looks like, this looks like a black and white image. <clears throat> the numbers for this are one, one, and one. And if I look at the numbers for the other one, it's like, you know, 0 0.01, 0 0.01, 0 0.01. In this area, it's like 0.9. So if I took one and I added it to 0.9, it literally is just going to like add those two numbers together. What I want to do, <clears throat> the reason for using the ambient occlusion is not to um, uh, brighten it, but it's to take the areas where there is um, uh they call them contact shadows, these like dark areas, and it makes them a little bit deeper, okay? So instead of being an over, we're gonna set this to be a multiply. So double click the over, I'll preview it so I can see it, <clears throat> and set it to multiply. And then now I'll do the one and two again, so you can see, just add another thing, and send that last merge to be a multiply. Okay. So what that's going to do is it's going to take those areas where we have basically like a cavity or something where there really wouldn't be a lot of light inside of it. <clears throat> and it's just going to make it a bit darker. You can really see it on these buttons here. These are actually like modeled into it. Here, they're very hard to see. It's kind of like a little bit soft, but once we add that ambient occlusion to it, which is what AO stands for, it darkens those and kind of deepens them. Even here, you can see a little bit more deepening in that area, okay? Uh, also here where the screen is, you can see how, again, it just kind of deepens those, those uh, areas, right? Cool. Yep, it just makes it a little bit crisper, a little more vibrant. Uh, these areas here, anywhere we have a cavity, see how it just darkens those and deepens it. Okay. Yep. Okay. So <clears throat> now go into your viewer area and hit A. What are we looking at? You've screwed up everything. Hold on. <laughs> Make sure you're on your merge. Then go in there and hit A. Your last merge. Okay. 
At the beginning, we set up our settings. <clears throat> yep, so it's automatically here, 1280 by 720. Otherwise, this would come in at some crazy resolution, and then we would have to shrink it here or resize it or, or change that value. If we set it up at the start of it, everything comes in, it's automatically set up like that. So we hit tab, constant. <clears throat> we, can, we should get this a color. It's difficult to see if it works, if it's a black image we're replacing with a black image. So click on, um, Nuke's color selection sucks, but just deal with it. <clears throat> click on the color selection thing here, the color wheel, <clears throat> and then you can slide the colors up. There we go. Yeah. On the constant, that little color wheel next to the black box. It's weird, right? Because it, I just want like Adobe's one. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, okay, so now what we're going to do, just the color bar and uh, the color wheel on the properties. Yep, and then just slide those things. Um, cool, so now we need to merge these two things together. <clears throat> so when you merge something, A is on top and B is on the bottom. So which one is going to be the A and which one is going to be the B? Right, the copy is going to be the A, and then the constant will be the background, okay? So we click nothing, <clears throat> we hit M for merge, and we do exactly that, A, B. Cool. Uh, let's find a good spot for this merge here, right? So maybe like down there is good. And there is good. Cool. Uh, I'm going to go through and let me just see what we have here. So this is transmission code specular. What was the one I want? It is transmission. Why isn't transmission? Now it's working, whatever. There we go. Okay, so something else that let's, uh, we need to pay attention to here. <clears throat> um, if I go to, let's say this copy here, and I go to my list of channels that are available, all the original channels are actually still available, okay? So if I go here to transmission, I can see the transmission, it's right there. If I go down here to this merge, that is no longer an option and I've lost all of my channels, okay? So one of the things that happens is as you merge stuff together, things will just start disappearing based off of what is the A and what is the B. I'm gonna lose the shape of this, but just bear with me a second. I'm going to switch these <clears throat> and now I get them all back. Okay. So something to be aware of is if you try to access a channel later on, it may just disappear because of that type of situation. If I go to the merge here and I tell it to also merge all, what should happen is I should get all of those back and still have my other stuff inside that list. Okay. So here's transmission, it's still there. So go to your last merge <clears throat> and change that to a also merge all. And that way it will merge all of your channels into that same uh, output, okay? Nope, leave your A the, the way you had it, okay? On this merge, you want to say also merge all. And that way we have access to the transmission, okay? All right, so now what we need to do is this screen is not very glowy. There should be a bit more glow to the screen. So I want to add a glow to it. So I'm going to click off of everything <clears throat> and then add a glow to this. 
and then I'm going to connect it. Nope, I'm gonna said hit tab and type glow. Yep, if you type in glow without hitting tab, you're gonna get however many hotkeys that opens up. Okay, so add a glow, connect it to the merge, and then take a look at it and see what it looks like. Now, something to look at also, whenever you're adding nodes, <clears throat> I'm telling you to click off and then add it and then connect it manually. As beginners, sometimes you have something else clicked. If I'm clicked way up here and I click glow, it's gonna add it right after that node and you may not notice it, okay? So, <clears throat> as a beginner, definitely click off of stuff and then add your glows and whatever else. When you start putting them back into the chain, if I take this and slide it on top of that line, it will know to just drop it into the mix, okay? So if I just drop it on top of it, it highlights, and there it is. And I think, if, if I'm remembering correctly, if I grab it and shake it vigorously, nope, that's not it. That was a different software. There's a software where it does work. It, like, disconnects it. Um, and here I have to hit, um, I don't know, the hotkey, shift, uh, something. I can't remember it right now. Yeah, or drag the arrow off, right? Sometimes it's in the middle, you don't want to reconnect everything. All right, so what happened with our glow? What glowed? Pretty much everything. <laughs> Pretty much everything. What do we want to glow? The transmission, the transmission right? <clears throat> so that screen area, I want to isolate just the screen and have that be what glows. So in the properties for the glow, <clears throat> um, there's a mask. A mask is different than what we're going to use. A mask will literally just cut the glow out. So it's like the glow does not exist outside this box. What we want to do is feed in information to say, this is the area I want to glow, and you can glow outside of that, okay? <clears throat> right, so it'll fade it off of that area. So if I go to the width channel and choose transmission, and again, red, green, or blue, we'll fig figure out which one looks best. <clears throat> I just chose red. I think red probably uh, was what I used before. And then what we should see is that now the glow only exists in that area, right? Uh, but it does go maybe a little bit beyond that area as well, too. If you're not seeing the glow, make sure you're viewing it. Uh huh. That's right. Yep. That's where you want it. What was that? Right below this transmission way up here. Yeah. Don't do it there because what will happen is as the screen is like rotating around, we may want some glow above it. But because we've uh, had that mask, it's going to cut it. Okay? So you want your glow to happen at the very end of this thing right there. No, no, at the very last merge. <clears throat> You don't, we're not using the mask, but that's just another option inside here. Because usually people will go to the mask area thinking that I can just hit the mask button and it'll all be good. Okay. This is your last merge. Yeah. Glows right there. Yeah. Okay. And then I just changed the width channel to transmission red. Okay. And then you can play with the settings up here. It's a pretty interactive now. <clears throat> if we take the tolerance up, there it goes. Uh, we can kind of limit where it's glowing. <clears throat> if we take the brightness up, it's going to make it brighter. Uh, if we take the saturation down, it's going to desaturate the glow. And if we take the size up, it'll make it glow bigger or smaller. And this is what I was talking about in the right spot, because you can see, I don't want this much glow, it's too much. But this is actually glowing beyond the limits of that device. Yes, sir. All right, so again, you can play with these settings and really get you know, exactly what you want with this. <clears throat> I'm going to leave it at maybe a bigger glow, but softer brightness. Sometimes you want to see, like, what does just the glow look like? And there's a button right here, effect only. I only want to see what the effect of this is. 
and now I can see, oh, that's what it looks like. I may want to adjust the coloring of this or tweak it or modify it, and sometimes I'll actually take the uh, glow, do its own thing to the glow, and then take my original stuff and then put those two things back together. So I may branch off, let's say, here's my glow, here's all this stuff happening to it, and then I reconnect it to this merge node to put everything back together, just so you can kind of see what that would look like. This and that. You're not doing this part, I'm just showing. There we go. Here's a grade. Here's a uh, hue correct, hue shift. There we go. Okay. So here I took my glow. <clears throat> I added a grade to it to brighten it up a little bit. I added a hue shift to give it these kind of like tints of blue. You're not doing this, I'm just showing you. And then I just added it right back into that mix. Okay. So it's just an extra thing, just so that in case I needed to do that kind of stuff, that is available. That is something I could do, okay? Uh, if I want to delete stuff, look how easy it is to delete stuff, and then you just connect it back in, and then you just turn that effect off. So amazing, right? Cool. All right, let's save our stuff. So hit Control S, we haven't saved in a while. <clears throat> just to be extra safe, hit Save As, and save this as version two. And that way you're for sure saving your stuff. You can quadruple check, go into your uh, P drive folder, make sure all your stuff is there. Yep, so just call it 002. All right, we'll look at it. Uh, and then back up your Winter 19 folder. Take that whole folder, drop it on your external drive. Obviously, that's going to take a minute to copy because we have three gigs worth of stuff. <clears throat> when you come in next time, if your stuff is already on the computer, you can just copy any files that maybe you updated, just your nuke file, okay? Um, cool. Uh, 